Very, very welcome, everyone. I hear discussions have already started, and uh, uh, many of you are finding uh, interesting people to, to speak to, and that's uh, exactly what this uh, festival is all about. My name is Maria Gratchev. I'm the director at the Nordic Council of Ministers here in um, Estonia. Uh, this is our uh, Nordic and Norden tent uh, for all of uh, today. We are very, very happy to start with this uh, first panel that will discuss, discuss uh, issues of, of loneliness, uh, perhaps also issues opposite to loneliness. Um, important and timely topic. I will hand the mic over to uh, Jonas uh, Keidling uh, Lindholm, who is the director at uh, a Danish think tank called uh, Monday Morning. And uh, what's interesting about uh, this panel is not only the speakers and what they will say, but it's a panel that has been touring around some of the Nordic and Baltic democracy and opinion festivals. So this is a relay um, that takes place in, in several places. And I know that uh, Jonas is bringing uh, questions, thoughts, comments from some of the other festivals uh, that will also be, be brought up uh, today. So it's, uh, it's, a new, uh, it's a new way for us to, to work on, on, on this panel. But everyone, very, very welcome. And uh, Jonas, over to you and your good hands for, for this hour. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for this introduction. Also, a warm welcome uh, from me um, to this debate that, as Maria uh, said, is organized jointly between the Nordic Council of Ministers' Office here in, in Estonia and the Copenhagen-based think tank uh, Monday morning, Elementa Morn. True, my name is Jonas, Jonas Keiding Lindholm. I'm a sociologist of background, but a director uh, with the uh, think tank. So over the next hour, an hour to uh, a half, uh, the topic here is loneliness among young adults. And the reason for this uh, is the significant challenge that rising loneliness is presenting in all the Nordic and Baltic countries, affecting both young and old, profoundly impacting the quality of life of marginalized groups, such as citizens with disabilities or mental health issues, pushing them into the fringes of society. We know from, we know from data that it could even be fatal for individuals suffering from loneliness. In other words, the topic of today is a significant issue at the both the individual and the societal level it's a challenge that calls for a broad effort from a cross-section of stakeholders and requires an exploration and application of a range of different solutions. So the topic of loneliness among young adults in Estonia, uh, it's a complex phenomenon. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later now about how much we actually know about, about the, the prevalence, if you like, of it. But it's a phenomenon across the Nordic countries in worrying growth. That we know. It has deep impacts, um, despite the, 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 uh, the little uh, comprehensive data we have at the moment. At the same time, as many of you will know, the political and public debate around young people, around their thriving, their social media use, etc., is quite significant. Um, yet often rather dramatizing and lacking in nuances, uh, uh, one could argue. So again, loneliness is a topic of great interest, it's a topic of great concern, and we'll try and attempt to explore and deepen our understanding of this phenomenon uh, during the next uh, hour and hour and a half here in this uh, tent. We'll do so by shedding light on both the driving social, cultural, generational and digital factors influencing the rising, the rising loneliness uh, among youth. We'll also try to explore some solutions uh, in order to curb the trend and help reduce loneliness and social exclusion among young adults. And as Maria was saying, the debate here in Estonia is the fourth in a series of Nordic and Baltic conversations on this issue that's taking place throughout the season of democracy festival. 
It's a loneliness debate relay, as we call it. And the purpose is to identify and debate barriers and solutions to address and overcome loneliness. And where possible, across the Nordic and Baltic region, to share experiences and solutions. In the previous three democracy festivals, we debated loneliness among the elderly. That was in Sweden. We debated the interplay between technology and youth loneliness in Denmark, loneliness and marginalized groups outside the mainstream in Latvia just a month ago. And next week in Norway, I'll be moderating debate on gender and loneliness. Insights and recommendations from all these debates, plus a lot of desk research, um, will eventually end up forming a report that will be put before the Nordic Council of Ministers in order to inspire their new action plan in the social area in connection with their vision for 2030. To help us debate this topic of uh, young adult loneliness and broader around mental health, um, here in Baide, we have a really competent panel of experts with us today. On my right side, we have Annie Marquardt, founder and CEO of the NGO Center for Digital uh, Pedagogic. It's a Danish organization. We have Ott Oja, uh, CEO of the Estonian Mental Health and Wellbeing Coalition, also called VATEC, at least for a few days. You know, you can you can explain uh, it, that. It will still be called. It will still be called VATEC in a few days, but I won't be the CEO anymore. But you won't be the CEO anymore. <laughs> okay, very good. We have uh, Katarina Järve, chairperson of the board, Federation of Estonian Student Unions, and Dina Smoljakova, um, and I hope I get this right, Dina, dance movement and dialectical behavior therapist. Ah, uh, there you go. There you go. Also, social worker with an organization called NGO, uh, it, it's a papa vert. There you go. So, in order for this to work, uh, speaking about dialectical behavior, in order for this to work in a proper way, in the spirit of the Democracy Festival, I really hope that you as an audience will uh, engage a lot in this topic. I hope you're here, because this is an interest, uh, th this is a topic you have a keen interest in, you might have experiences, you might have perspectives that you want to offer. I would really, really welcome that as a moderator, and I know the panel shares that uh, sentiment. Uh, um, and I'm pretty sure that your experiences, your questions will help qualify the, the, the important conversation that we are having here uh, today. Um, the way I prefer to run it is that, is that you can ask questions during the debate. It, it's not the kind of thing that we have five minutes left and then you can raise your hands. So please, if you do want to engage, uh, raise a question or have a comment, in relation to the um, to the uh, to the topic that we are that we are debating, it it simply works by raising your hand, and I'll try and direct a microphone at your end. But first, let us hear a bit from our panel about their wor work in relation to today's topic. Annie, do you want to go first? Yes, thank you. Um, I come from a Danish uh, NGO and organization called Center for Digital Pedagogic, in English Center for Digital Youth Care. We have, um, I am the founder and CEO, and as uh, all good organizations that work with technology, we started in a cellar in, uh, in a little office in uh, Denmark with only volunteers. Today we are like 30 uh, employees and uh, 60 volunteers that work with uh, young people and their digital living. And um, <coughs> I think b the reason why I'm here is uh, obviously because of our knowledge about technology and uh, the way of living with technology as a human being, uh, but also uh, to put a bit of light on how we, uh, how how is the how is uh, the temperature among Danish young people. Uh, I think there's a lot of similarities between the Estonian young people and the Danish young people. There's a lot of uh, of way of living in Estonia that uh, obviously look like the same as in Denmark. Uh, we work with um <coughs> different kind of technologies. We uh, have a really large um, portfolio of uh, our own uh, counselings uh, where young people can uh, reach out and talk to uh, psychologists or pedagogues about uh, their well-being. We have we run like four different platforms, uh, kind of online uh, uh, 
uh, you can call it in Danish clubhouse, where people, uh, young people can come and, uh, and meet other young people online. So what I'm going to put on the table today is that I think some of the way we can work with young people uh, and, um, and uh, prevent uh, isolation could be by uh, meeting each other online. I know there's also some risk, and we can talk about that also today, but I think in the way we look at it, there's a lot of possibilities in being online as well. Thanks, Annie. Let's, let's also hear from, uh, from the others. Thanks. Ott, you want to go next? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm currently the CEO of Wattec, which is uh, a mental health umbrella organization here in Estonia. We have 54 member organizations, uh, which, uh, uh, which together are working to advance uh, the mental health sector here in Estonia. Uh, both po uh, national policy-wise and also just their per, uh, the organization's cooperations within themselves as well. And so one of my primary roles for the past five years has been advocacy, de developing mental health policy in Estonia from this, uh, the NGO side. And uh, what brought me actually personally to, to that was that I actually used to be a math teacher and uh, I just had way too many suicidal students. Uh, and wow. I felt that I need to nip that somewhere earlier. Like that, uh, it's too late when I'm uh, with them when they're 16 plus, and uh, we're trying to solve those issues. While well, these things should have been addressed, or the causes were much earlier, and uh, there was help possible much earlier. And as mentioned, uh, these are my last few days on this current job. So, uh, as of uh, the end of next week, I'll be working for the city of Tallinn to build up the city's mental health, uh, youth and uh, ch children's mental health strategy. Uh, so the t city of Tallinn hopefully uh, will manage to there to really take uh, youth mental health really seriously. Thanks, Art. That also means that any guidance, any recommendations from the audience to, to Art, he'll bring it straight into his new role in, in Tallinn. Uh, Katarina? Yes, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm the chairperson of uh, the Federation of Estonian Student Unions, which represents all the Estonian students, both studying in uh, universities and universities of applied sciences in Estonia. Um, I work every day with students. We have 45,000 students approximately in Estonia. And uh, what I see a lot is that uh, they struggle uh, hugely uh, with mental health issues. Um, there's also statistics that uh, the students that go straight from the high school uh, to university, they struggle more. Uh, so this is why I'm also here to bring a kind of the young perspective, since uh, this is what I see and hear every day, both in my own university studies from my course mates, but also in my work where we uh, try to advocate actually on the national level and also try to advocate on the international level to actually find the solutions uh, to support students. Thanks, Katarina. Dina? Hello, everyone. First of all, great to see you all here. Um, I'll be talking today more of, of the perspective of a professional practitioner who works every day with young people and teenagers, young adults. Um, so my everyday job is um, in the settings of uh, social rehabilitation. Um, also, I represent an organization called Piasi, as you can see on my logo, uh, where I work more as a trainer in mental health field, as well raising and talking about issues of um, mental health. Um, what I can say from my uh, working experience that uh, issues has become more mm, serious over the past few years, I would say, because I went on maternity leave when COVID just started and when I came back to work, I was like, wow, I was really surprised that uh, I'm not getting the same clients. Uh, clients don't come just with some, let's say, mild problems, issues in school or something. But there's lots of suicide prevention, um, a lot of self-harm, addictive behaviors. So uh, the topic is very important for me as well. Thank you also to you, Dina, and, and welcome to, to all of you in the panel. Now. Before we open uh, the, the, the debate, um, we do need to um, answer a question that was put to us from the debate in Latvia. So as I was explaining earlier, this is a debate relay, which means that uh, 
beyond focusing, which we do, you know, which we do for the lion's share of the debate, beyond focusing on the topic here, we also um, uh, receive a question from the previous debate, and we'll be sending on at the end of this debate a question to the next democracy festival. And in Latvia, um, there was a conversation around around stigma and loneliness. So what the panel in uh, in 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 Latvia has 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 asked this panel to to offer your your perspective on is how can we combat the stigma surrounding loneliness in order to better engage and empower young people who suffer from loneliness and can healthy humor help in this regard and I should say there was a uh, there was a stand-up comedian in the panel and and that's how this this question around the healthy humor uh, came into question. So essentially, two questions. Let's take the first one first about stigma. Uh, assuming there is a sense of stigma around people who feel lonely, how can we combat that stigma? It's open for all of you. I think um, in the Estonian context, uh, what I as a young person hear a lot from uh, the older generations, uh, especially some uh, certain politicians as well, is that um, you're weak when you have problems, you're a snowflake. Uh, and I feel like this, when this comes from the almost the state level, this kind of um, mindset, I feel like it's really difficult for also young people to come out and uh, say, like admit that they have a problem and ask for help. I feel like this comes uh, also in some families. Uh, and I think this is the first thing we need to work on, so uh, to actually say that it's okay to uh, to speak about it, not to uh, minimize, in a way, uh, the things that young people go through, just because uh, other people, older generations, uh, apparently didn't have these problems, doesn't mean that uh, these are not valid. So I feel like this uh, kind of mindset uh, should be the first thing to go, uh, to actually help young people to admit that they have a problem and ask for help. Mm. Yeah, Dina? Yeah, I agree with um, Katarina that uh, it shouldn't be a taboo talking about this uh, because I think there's a lot of shame and guilt also uh, related to feeling of loneliness and because there are, let's say, young people are facing very high expectations from the, with the society side. So can one person really say or admit I actually feel lonely? And uh, what I see often it's covered or people try to cover it with some other issues like, okay, I'm just stressed, um, it's a depression or something, and it's my anxiety. But uh, actually deep inside there might be a feeling of deep loneliness. Mm. So where should we be having that conversation, Odd? Oh, where? That's uh, I actually do like this, uh, like, the end of that co question, where where where, you st where you start from, from uh, basically from that comedy side. I mean, yeah. I mean here. Have a go at it. How here? I mean, mostly uh, stand up comedy. Uh, stand up comedy has always been sort of this taboo breaker. They go into topics, they share personal details, uh, which are considered things that you're not supposed to share usually, and. Uh, they always sort of need to be ahead of uh, the rest of society on uh, talking about these taboos because that's how we sort of build humor in our society. So, yeah, I think uh, comedy is a really good source there. Uh, the challenge, of course, in this regular social life of breaking these barriers is the part that when you're lonely, you're isolated from other people. So you, in that isolation, you don't see that other people also experience isolation because you're distant from that. So I think the problem sort of starts there that you're already isolated and it's hard to get that c other perspective to you if you don't have connections. So, and of course, these just general social strategies of how do I actually build connections? Uh, are my connections source only the things that, or the, or the people that I meet at uh, school or at work? Or how do I m build other connections? We usually often don't really consider these, at least not knowingly. I guess we're already now starting to talk about uh, a really sort of crucial issue uh, as part of the solution package around how do we build more inclusive communities, if you like, where you can feel safe uh, also in, in, uh, 
in uh, in sort of expressing what what hurts in life and a lot hurts in life as we all know. Uh, but but Annie, I also want to bring you in on 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 the first p point from Katerina around the the polarized and often some dramatized sort of public discourse. This is this is certainly something that we, that you know that, that that we've seen in 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 other countries as well, including in Denmark. Yeah, I've I really much agreed with with you, Katerina. That I think the first thing, and uh, it's an issue we also is very uh, been talking a lot about in Denmark. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, there's a, a gap between generation and uh, and, and a, a, a generation gap between the understanding about vulnerability. I think that's the first thing to to uh, to put focus on that. Uh, that that the young generation are speaking about uh, vulnerability on another way in the older generation. So I think this stigma um, and those taboos has to come out in the open. And I very much agree with you that humor. And I saw your question: uh, healthy humor can that be a way of addressing it? And I now I'm working with the digital young people, and uh, and uh, in a digital life we see also humor being used on a uh, meme cultures. Uh, it could be. It could be on videos and so on. And uh, and actually, humor can be used to break isolations. Though we have to remember, it has to be done with care, so we don't make more stigma. So I I, I see the same similarities in Denmark as well as uh, as here. And I also think that humor can be used to to break the ice as well. Yeah, can I, can I give a re on, on that? I, I would really want to give a humor warning on uh, when you're talking to especially teenagers. No sarcasm, please, with teenagers. Uh, seriously, uh, it's a, it's a meant, uh, it's a uh, cognitive, uh, uh, what I, uh, cognitive development thing. <laughs> teenagers actually literally uh, cannot often uh, understand uh, this, uh, this sort of uh, humor. Um, Even they use it themselves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I've screwed up with that as a teacher sometimes, and uh, you s really see them, like you think you're making a, a joke, and uh, mm. you just sort of crush them okay. accidentally. So really need to learn to keep away from that with teenagers. Let's, let's um, thanks for answering this question from uh, from uh, from your colleagues uh, in uh, in Latvia. Can I no. still add about the humor part, please? Go ahead, Dina. <laughs> I mean, you've just uh, done just it anyway. We just have very so. interesting <laughs> results from South Estonia. Yeah. Because Peasi has been starting a wonderful thing, um, engaging people uh, to a joke writing course. And 23 people have completed this course, uh, starting from mm, last year. And uh, 12 of them started performing, actually. So we already have this first experience when uh, people were trained how to write the jokes about their mental problems, mental health problems, and um, actually have a experience of bringing it to the audience. So that was very successful. And in October this year, uh, they'll be coming our British uh, partners um, who developed also this therapeutic uh, work um, using um, comedy writing to combat um, suicide, like as a suicide prevention um, intervention. Thanks. So there's a role for jokes, not sarcasm with your teenagers. Uh, there's a role for, for jokes. There's definitely a job around enlightening our decision makers. Uh, and, there's a, and there's an issue around, around the intergenerational divide or the, the sort of the, the lack of understanding between the old and the younger uh, generation. Good answers. Thanks for that. Now let's move on. Um, and and I want in this in this in this round I want to try and and uh, I want to try us to try and get an understanding of sort of the depth and breadth of the issue of uh, of loneliness here in uh, in Estonia. And Art, I want to try and put you on the on 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 the spot here. Um, so what what do we actually know about? young adults' uh, well-being and mental health here in, in, in Estonia? We know quite a bit about uh, their well-being and mental health. We don't know that much uh, directly about their loneliness. There aren't very many... Oh, I don't think there's actually any uh, research that directly approaches uh, at a population scale youth loneliness. It is there are questions in a few sort of uh, research uh, uh, areas uh, where we
we can maybe get a little bit, but it's it's still a bit too far. But we do know that uh, these social structures and these this uh, social connectedness is a really important part of uh, preventing mental health issues uh, to providing support when uh, we have challenges. Because mental health issues still start from sim usually from simpler challenges where our social structures could support us through it. And when we look at the Estonian population in general, uh, among age brackets, just the biggest risk factor of having sort of uh, a, this, uh, a mental health issue is being in the age bracket of 18 to 24. Mm -hmm. In this research, we didn't, uh, we don't have but that much data on the younger years, at least compared to the other uh, ages. So among adults, being 18 to 24 year old, really bad idea. Don't don't be 18 to 24, 24 year old. Uh, you'll probably be having some mental health issues, uh, especially in the sense of ha ha being at risk of mental health issues and actually getting uh, help on that. And so what do we know about the? Uh, I mean, are there differences between between? B b b b b I mean, between the sexes here, between uh, male mm -hmm. and female. So, uh, on that side, of course, uh, as in most uh, in most populations, uh, women's mental health uh, sort of it, it, there there are more mental health issues among women, but it's actually not even as big as you would expect. If we, if we look at uh, su uh, at uh, depression ri risk mm -hmm. among uh, uh, this group, it's something around 45 percent among uh, 18, 24 year olds. Uh, so among around 44, 45 percent for men, and around 50 percent for women. Now, there's a, l a lot less of them actually have a specific diagnosis, which refers to if they're mm -hmm. getting actual medical help on this side. Mm -hmm. And this ga gap is the largest in the entire population. Mm -hmm. So it's the uh, population that has the most challenges and is the most at risk of depression and actually gets the least mental health uh, help in the medical uh, system. Mm. And is there, is, is there any evidence to suggest that, that this is following a growth curve? Yeah, definitely the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, it, it basically really just upped the stress level uh, reduced uh, sort of these social connections, and we're still seeing the effects uh, there. We don't have sort of ideal ways of tracking that because we didn't really measure it that much beforehand. Mm. We have some research that shows that these uh, uh, anxiety and uh, depression risk is higher in the same age brackets as it than it was previously. Uh, but mm. I think uh, the most telling is what specialists see. Uh, it the picture has really shifted I can yeah and I want I wanted to exactly get to you now Dina and and, and also let if we, I mean if we try and unpack this a little bit uh, because there I mean there will clearly be 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 some people here with you know with a with a clinical uh, disorder if you, if you like but I assume a lot of the young people that you meet are also suffering from what you call more psychosocial uh, sort of issues or, or how would you how would you describe it from your work I think most of my clients they actually have some kind of psychiatric diagnosis um, or maybe sometimes on their arrival uh, to the service they don't have but then they get diagnosed very often uh, what I wanted to add I came across one um, mm, recent study of um, Finnish Red Cross so our neighbors basically and they showed uh, the results showed that um, rates of loneliness hasn't actually returned to where they were before COVID so I think uh, the situation in Estonia is not very much different and what's regarding um, loneliness or is it uh, really different between men and women boys and girls could be related again in uh, stigma related to men's mental health, like how often they actually seek help, go to a professional. Uh, with young people also there's uh, often a solution of um, um, risky behavior. They try to regulate uh, their problems uh, somehow by themselves or what's recommended somewhere else. Before we take a question from the uh, from the audience, let uh, just another question to you, Dina. It, from your work, uh, I'd like to try and understand a little bit what what's the background for the situation that the young people are coming with. Are there any sort of commonalities, any common patterns in 
in in the type right. of disorders or, or issues that you well see? Well, let's say among the teenagers, there's a lot of ADHD. It's been diagnosed, uh, autistic spectrum disorders, um, depression, anxiety, a lot of comorbid, actually, a lot of comorbidity, I would say. Uh, and how does lo the issue of loneliness and how does the issue of loneliness come up in 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 that context? I think if we start digging deeper, it doesn't matter whether it's anxiety or depression. Mm. Uh, young people, I think, often they feel maybe don't maybe they don't say it themselves like oh I feel lonely, but they somehow feel left out, misunderstood, not seen, not heard uh, by the society in general, by the parents, by the teachers. Uh, by peers as well, actually. So when someone feels really excluded and not belonging, I think that's when it's getting really difficult. Right. Now let's 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 take a question from the audience. If you can, if you can stand up, yeah. s say your name and and. Feld, I'm with the Estonian Degrowth Organization. So um, what I wanted to point out is that has loneliness always been a problem, or is it? Has it been increasing more recently? And if it's been increasing, then what did the society do differently in the past when maybe there was less loneliness? Wha how have things changed? Maybe that will give us an idea of what's going wrong and what should be changed and uh, improved. Thank you. So, Art? Yeah, and um, here mm, I will not be able to cite precise precise data, but uh, these general trends, yes, uh, in the sense that there used to be, in uh, at least Western societies, more of these social activities, things that we did together, that uh, brought us uh, together as well. And this shift has been a bit from, first off, just social roles as well. Uh, I, I would say this is especially for men, uh, but for a good reason because uh, it was often that uh, the r sort of traditional family structure put the woman in the house and take care of the child. The man is at work, then comes home, maybe goes to the bar with friends. And now we are finally sharing those responsibilities more. Uh, so it was a, it was a really bad uh, situation for women and uh, a lighter situation for men. Another part of that is also that our sort of our built environment also has shifted a lot. We used to like just take Tallinn. Like uh, when I was born, uh, then Tallinn had less than half the cars it has right now, and people were getting around on the street, walking. You take a, uh, a bus, uh, taking a bike. Now uh, you don't want to go out to the streets anymore. Uh, and now that I actually I have a cat that I take out for a walk at the front of the house, so it's. Uh, my neighbor neighbors love that, and now I've gotten to know basically all of my neighbors through that. But if I, I don't do that, I never meet my neighbors. Thanks, Rob. We will actually, this is a really relevant question, and thanks for putting it. We will hopefully, uh, in the course of this debate, also be uh, touching upon some of, the, some of the other both societal, cultural factors that could be, that could be part of the explanation uh, behind this, uh, this, uh, this growth. Uh, now, Katerina, it's, it's, it's your generation that we're talking about here, as you also pointed out yourself early on. Now, and as you were saying, um, that this, you know, the issue of, of loneliness or, you know, not feeling, not feeling included is, is, is very well known. Can you try and put some more words into it? I mean, what, what, what is it that, that, that you as students um, experience? Well, uh, I talked about the risk group. I actually belong to that risk group. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I feel like um, actually 18 to 24 is mainly uh, students, at, le at least in Estonia. There's a lot of uh, pressure uh, also um, uh, to the question from the audience. Also, there's a lot of uh, stresses compared to what it was before. So you have social media, you have so much information all the time around you. Uh, you have access to everything uh, within seconds. You need to make all the time decisions about whether something is valid or not, uh, whether it's actually relevant to you or not. So I feel like this has already uh, raised the stress levels. Uh, for Estonian case, I feel like it's also the geopolitical uh, situation. Uh, so we are living next to Russia. Uh, which I see has affected a lot and I think this is one of the course uh, 
problems which has affected the, the fact that we haven't actually gone back to the stage we were before COVID because the geopolitical uh, situation changed rapidly. And when I see also a lot of things are also, yes, the world doesn't uh, revolve around money, um, but uh, for students it does because actually the age group we were talking about 18 to 24 it's usually when people move out for the first time they start living alone they start uh, going to university they, they start working um, there's al also statistics that 70% uh, of students in Estonia actually work and around half of them work more than 20 hours per week and when you're a student you're supposed to wor study full-time so 40 hours when you work even more than 20 hours there's not much time for rest. Uh, you need to worry about how you get by a lot. And I feel like this is um, also the biggest <coughs> I see. Yeah. Uh, I feel like this is also the biggest difference I see uh, when I look, for example, the Nordic uh, students, because uh, in the Nordics, there's a lot of support systems, financial support systems for the students. Uh, in Estonia and in the Baltics, we are a bit behind with that. So we don't actually have the study loan which would cover a year of studies. Um, this is not a reality right now for Estonian students. We don't have um, state stu uh, study grants for people. Um, yes, we do for people that are extremely uh, poor uh, from the extremely difficult families. But um, it, it's really difficult to get these grants. So I feel like the socio-economical situation actually is also the biggest stressor. Thanks, Katerina. Um, Annie, um, I want to try and bring you on the spot here now because um, there was recently uh, published uh, a really extensive uh, study in, in Denmark on, 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 on young people's thriving, uh, misthriving, um, including, including loneliness. Um, could you try and sort of share some of the highlights from that? from that uh, study. It was a significant empirical uh, empirical study and, and probably, as far as I know, the most comprehensive till, till, till date. Um. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, first, I, I, I would like just to take one step uh, back and uh, I think this discussion about uh, um, <coughs> the difference in being a female or male and, and seek uh, help is uh, very interesting because in Denmark we have the same discussions in the moment uh, and uh, I think this uh, debate also uh, has the issues to bring out new knowledge and uh, in Denmark we, we are the first country to make a strategy for men's health the Minister for Dig Digitalization and uh, Equal Rights, they are c connected in Denmark, I don't know why, but they are. <laughs> uh, they have just uh, put out a strategy so we can start working with men's uh, way of seeking help as well, because I think you're really right in that uh, women has a, a tradition and a, a language for asking for help more than men has. There's a famous singer in Denmark called Tobias Rahim, and he say he, he sings that when uh, men seek help, they drink, they take drugs, and go to war. <laughs> so I think this uh, this uh, mindset about changing the way of seeking help is uh, is a really good way to start. And then back to your question, uh, Jonas. Um, uh, the um, center, um, what you say in English, uh, center for youth uh, research, uh, center for uh, what do they call it in Danish? Center for Ungdomsforskning in Danish, uh, did a really large research uh, last year, and um, and they put focus on three main uh, issues uh, to put eye on and. Uh, the first is uh, the acceler acceleration of the society, as you say, uh, Katerina. There's a lot of things you have to take care of, um, and things happen very fast uh, in society today. And that's about the whole structure, as you say. We, p we, we don't walk, we drive, we don't uh, meet in the physical room, we meet in the digital room and ex accelerate uh, our way of being uh, human on. And the second one uh, is those are and those accelerations can be overwhelming, hard to comprehend. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and that makes you sort of 
Yeah, that can recline put you, uh, and, put uh, you, and put you outside. Yeah, and, and uh, isolate you because it's overwhelming, as you say. Um, the other thing is, um, she talked about the psychosization of uh, of the human being, and that was actually what we start talking about. That uh, we are we we are psycho we have been psychosized more than we did early in life. And that's in a good way because we we can um, reduce stigma uh, and ta taboos. But uh, we can also uh, the bad fi side of that can be that we uh, actually uh, talk too much about it and we s keep eating our wounds and they won't heal. So so I think there's uh, the good thing about that and but there's also uh, bad things about it. Actually, in Norway, they have started, uh, because in Denmark, uh, it is that way that if you have had a, a diagnosed, you can't get rid of it again. If you, have, if, if you have cancer, you can get rid of it, you can get it out of your uh, journals, but in Denmark, it keeps following you the rest of your life. So if you've been diagnosed as a autism spectrum, you, you have to deal with that for the rest of your life. You can't get rid of it. So you, you actually diagnose for the rest of your life. You can't, maybe if you want to go to the army or you want to be a pilot or you want to drive a car, you can't, you can't get into it. So in Norway, they start uh, um, to work, the psychologists they start working to get off the diagnosed. And I think maybe that's also a way to look at it, that uh, if, if you have a, an issue when you're young, it shouldn't be following you for the rest of your life. Uh, and the last thing she's pointing out, uh, the, f uh, the researcher, she's, her name is uh, Naomi Kel Katz Nielsen. It's really difficult to remember. <laughs> um, and uh, she said it's the digitalization uh, as the last one because it's also put into the acceleration as well. The digitalization uh, gives us a lot of advantages. Uh, we can meet uh, easily with uh, people all, all over the world, with our friends. We can have groups online. We can have interest groups online. But we can also, uh, and we saw it under the convi, uh, con the convict dog down, that uh, you can also uh, be isolated behind screens. And I think you were talking about it before, that we see after the, the lockdown, uh, there's a lot of, especially in Denmark, young boys that hadn't come back to school again. So we see they've been isolated behind the screens as well. So the digitalization can, can give us advantages, but it can also give us uh, a lot of, uh, that we can stay home. We don't need to go out to talk to other people. We can stay home and that can, uh, that can uh, put us to even more isolation. Thanks, Annie. I think in many ways that these three, um, these three sort of analytical points around the the sheer acceleration in society and 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 the the the, the confounding sort of pressure that that applies uh, uh, to young people, the uh, the psychologization, as the f the fact that we are better in touch with our feelings, but also that there is a constant talk and there's also a constant expectation that you are emotionally in control actually has a, a really negative side for a lot of people. And then the last thing is around the digitalization. I'd like to dwell on that and ex expand a little bit about that. Because it, obviously, as we all know, this has been one of the major cultural factors impacting all spheres of life for the past, for the past 20, 25 years. Though bearing in mind, I think the first iPhone only came 12 years ago. It says something about how fast this, is, um, this has gone. Um, so on one hand, we are more com connected than ever. At the same time, we see high numbers of loneliness uh, emerging, i.e., people feeling disconnected. Help me try and help help me understand this paradox between being more connected and yet a large group, not all, feel disconnected. What should we make of that, Katarina? Yeah, as a young person, I feel like um, there's two sides. So there's the Instagram culture, uh, where you see other people uh, being successful. Uh, there's 15-year-olds uh, making millions uh, by dancing on TikTok, uh, buying houses when they're 20, you know. And then you see that uh, and feel like you are behind in life. I feel like this is the one side, uh, which makes it really difficult to actually feel connected. But the other side, I feel like, is... Uh, exactly what you mentioned, that 
we are more connected. You can connect with other people. You can find actually people that are like you. I feel like uh, it's especially important for the marginalized groups. Uh, in Estonia, for example, we are moving towards the Nordic culture, etc., uh, equal rights, everything. But uh, but I feel like we we have still a lot of work to do, and I think that that's when the digital uh, part comes in to play really really strongly because we can actually find people from uh, even I don't know across the world uh, that actually feel the same way that we do, uh, we can connect with them, we can share with them and uh, actually reduce the loneliness part. Hmm. I mean, this is a huge topic also politically. Uh, you know, there's, a, th there's increasingly sort of a discourse around regulating uh, big tech, parents should be standing up, you know, uh, uh, screen time should be defined, etc. Uh, Art, can you turn, I mean, what's your What's your perspective on this? You know, some would argue that you know this is more a panic here. Others, others would say no. There's definitely something to it. Uh, to the extent that it sort of dominates uh, uh, this, I mean, this, this discussion dominates uh, or talk uh, talks or discussions of youth mental health in the in the level that it's at. I would agree with you that it is a more open panic. It's uh, there are issues. But we tend to be looking at the ro in the wrong direction. Uh, for one thing, uh, really, sort of, we still seem to sort of distinguish between real life and online life. They are actually real people online, unless you're on Twitter, uh, and uh, you, the same people that you. Well, you are AI, but. <laughs> So the same people that you're uh, meeting in real life, you're often talking to them online, keeping up with them online. And this is uh, mostly a huge source of connection for people. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are uh, these sort of uh, doom scrolling. You're not really engaging yourself, but you're just uh, endlessly scrolling on t TikTok. And uh, there are... Uh, negative effects of that, but usually in uh, most sort of effects for uh, on, uh, between mental health issues and uh, web use or digital use, online use, it's the mental health issues that push people more online and isolate from their sort of physical side of their, their life, not uh, so much that the online life causes them to have mental health issues. Mm. Of course, there's that direction as well, but that's not the primary direction. So we should really more be talking about what we are doing outside of this. And basically, uh, not in, that in the sense that we set a limit for ourselves how much we're online. We set a goal or ourselves for how much we meet our friends in the real life. But I do want to get back to an aspect of that. Thanks for that, Art, and, and, point and, and, and then hear, hear your perspective on this, uh, Dina. I mean, a lot. There's been a lot of talk around perfection culture, uh, around you know, sort of the the high expectations that 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 particularly young people have to looks and body I images. And I think there is a significant body of evidence suggesting that 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 some of that is 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 exacerbated by by uh, by social media and the cr and the requirement for sort of self staging or, or self or self branding. So, so from a practice point of view, is any of that coming up in 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 your sort of client relations, or yeah, absolutely. can you recognize it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think if uh, before, let's say, young people would have pressure mainly from their maybe parents, like, okay, you need to go to the university, get an education, good job. So now there is like a lot of pressure from the whole world basically so the social media and um, I'll try to be as confidential as I can I used to have one client who said uh, basically I have to wear many different masks every day to fit in different categories if I go to school I have to act like this if I go to see those kind of friends I'm acting like I'm acting a different way and the other kind of friends so <laughs> when I first listened to her I was like wow that's pretty harsh <laughs> like how you cope with it and um, what I want to say, but the impact of social media, I see it's very dialectical. You cannot really look at it in black and white. There's been a positive 
impact as well. And I read some uh, American uh, researches uh, which showed that uh, the bigger number of Facebook friends actually had uh, positive results on subjective uh, well-being. Uh, but of course, there is negative impact where, where it can lead to um, misuse of social media, um, isolation, and all these kind of things. The th I mean, there certainly is some evidence suggesting that, that, that the um, we do see some correlation between lower self-worth and feeling of loneliness for particularly young girls, as I understand it, who can't, who don't seem to be able to, in their own perception, to live up to whatever sort of uh, glamorized ideals that they are being uh, presented with. But, uh, but, but, but any, um, you know, this is, uh, this, this is an issue in many ways at, that, at, at the center of some of the work that, that, that you know, that what you're doing. So what, what, what do we actually know? Or what do you hear uh, in, in, in your work? around this nexus between social media use or digitalization and thriving slash loneliness? Um, as you said, there's been, um, um, there's been a lot of debate in Denmark for the last two years. We've really been having a, a really, really political debate about uh, social media, digital life being. Uh, and I think we have raised, f for the last 10 years, we raised for uh, for articles in uh, in media from like uh, I think it was about I saw a, a statistic I think we had last year we had six thousand art articles about how to use a screen uh, so there's, it's a really big topic in Denmark uh, we did a in our organizations together with the three other organizations we did a large research uh, this spring and. Uh, and um, th there is no evidence whatsoever that uh, that loneliness uh, should be uh, increased by using uh, uh, using technology. Uh, we did though see that uh, like young persons with uh, an anxious anx anxiety anxiety. Uh, do has a larger amount of um, uh, uh, get worse by using uh, digital media because down scrolling uh, communities where you can uh, you can uh, increase the the level of discussions about your topics and so on so they get actually more isolated than for example other young people um, so, so so if you're already vulnerable if you like, yeah. then excessive social media use can can aggravate your your situation. Yeah, that's that's what the the research mm. found out that that those uh, there was try try if you are I s oh there's a child crying <laughs> yeah so if you're isolated you will you can be more isolated by by using screens. Um, in Denmark, there's also been a big research. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of people that don't use Facebook anymore, but uh, actually the, the function of groups is really high. There's like, in Denmark, there's 6,000 uh, different types of groups. Uh, and there's a lot of people who really gain a lot of uh, uh, community and uh, with other people in groups that's uh, with uh, similar topics. It can be knitting, it can be yoga, it can be whatever. And you find people, as you said, you can find people uh, you can mirrorize yourself in. So, um, so that there's no evidence, but there's really, really a lot of research out there, but no evidence yet. I think the only thing that's evidence where you talk about social media is that uh, we m that it's the lack of good sleep. <laughs> so, uh, s if you have your screen open before you sleep, uh, you, uh, you your sleep will be worse i think that's the only thing we actually have an evidence for mm -hmm. so uh, so hi for me a recommendation of uh, switch off the screen before you sleep so uh, but but not uh, not regards loneliness we can't see anything and i think we've been working with like digital communities for 20 years and actually we in denmark we were doing digital communities before facebook before google because we are that old an organization so we actually made national communities online and I see a tendency in Denmark that we're going back to national uh, communities because we don't want to be on the big tech platform we don't want to be 
uh, enrolled in the algorithm and, and the down scrolling and uh, we want to make and, and build good communities where we can uh, share uh, ideas, share knowledge, share friendships and I think that's the way we're probably going to work with the, the online uh, community in the future. I think we'll see less tech uh, communities and more uh, national communities. I think it could be crucial also for those people who are limited due to, let's say, whether it's physical disability or who cannot actually take part in the um, community, mm, I don't know, activities uh, in a this kind of physical way, or maybe who lives in uh, rural areas mm -hmm. who don't have access. So definitely digital solutions are very important and could be very helpful and positive. Yeah, and actually I saw that Nordisk Ministerrådet uh, has had asked, uh, I think, a group of young people uh, and asked them to give solutions to combat loneliness. And one of them was actually to make good online communities among 20 other good ideas, but that was one of them. So uh, I also think that the young generation can see a purpose doing that. Let me just reiterate my earlier point that if there are uh, questions, um, comments, perspectives among the audience here, we do have a microphone that can be uh, that can be shared with you, so you can uh, you can share that with us and 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 preferably also ask a question. Um, so stick your hand in the air and and, uh, and 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 pose a question. Now I do want to try and move to what you could call solutions now. Um, so solutions to <laughs> a phenomenon phenomenon that is growing. We have some data. We don't have a full understanding, uh, but still solutions based on your research, your research, the practice, and and your work at institutions. Um, let's try and 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 see. Um, let's try and hear from you, basically, um, where we could uh, intervene or where we could um, help uh, help young people in this, either in this critical period of their life or in this critical situation that they are that they are facing. And can I start with you, Art? You've mentioned a couple of times around social support structures, and and in our in our in our conversation uh, the other day, prior to this debate, um, you you also mentioned sort of intergenerational meeting places. So so can you can you share with us what your uh, what your thoughts are on that? Yeah. Um, so especially on the intergenerational part. Uh, for especially at least for the Estonians here, if you sort of start thinking about how our society is built, we've actually sort of deliberately built in structures to keep different generations apart from each other. Like I if you're school age, you go to school, once the school day is over at around three o'clock, this huge building with all these amenities, we usually shut that off. No adults allowed. Uh, no no other community allowed. Library, shut down. Uh, music classes, shut down. And then we ship the kids over to kids-specific uh, extracurricular activities uh, or to youth centers, no adults allowed. And uh, then for uh, the elderly, they have oftentimes these day centers. And again, very specifically for either the elderly or people with spe uh, special needs that get uh, services there. And we uh, I've especially seen this in smaller towns where these, uh, basically these buildings that serve very similar functions, serve them to, uh, with, uh, at different times, shutting down the same, fun uh, same functions at one time and sending, sending everyone off to the other building or separating for the same function in different generations. And now this basically just reduces the community where we can have connections. Of course, people of different generations usually find more connectedness within that generation. You've uh, had more similar experience, maybe similar ways of thinking, but still, it doesn't really make sense that we keep well what's the merit in that what would that contribute i mean what what would the positive attribution of that be to to loneliness uh one part is the simple expansion of this connectedness pool mm -hmm. we know more people 
we can find more similar interests with them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best examples of this, I think, are probably chess clubs, because ch chess is this sort of uh, hundreds of years old uh, game that all generations sort of at least uh, part of that generation play, play the game. So I've actually, as a very amateur player, I've been to one chess tournament and it was so exciting because I was playing with 12-year-olds uh, and 80-year-olds and everyone comes together for that. Everyone's on equal footing because those 12-year-olds will kick your ass. And you didn't bring your cat, though, did you? I not did not for bring that. my cat, so no. it wasn't that safe. Okay. Uh, so, so, so yeah, these places to create these connections, the able ability to learn from each other, mm. and this is important for all the old generations. Mm. I would take it think it's even especially important for the elderly, because mm. as lo uh, as we can ex ex expect. I mean, that was the conversation we had in Latvia on this. That that you know there was a there was a feeling that this could be beneficial to the elderly generation who are also suffering from a rising loneliness. However, the the young representative on the panel in Latvia said this is not high on our list. So so Katarina, would this be high on your list or the list of all your members? Do you see the merit in it? I see the merit in it, uh, yes, but I feel like uh, I need to agree with uh, my southern colleague <laughs> that um, there's so many things about it. I feel like uh, first, uh, and I feel like the most important thing is that we actually need to um, work on the accessibility and the, the availability of mental health help. Uh, we have a lot of struggles with that in Estonia. And I feel like there's firstly access to uh, the mental health help for the young people, but I also feel like uh, I would benefit a lot when my parents would go to the therapist, actually. Uh, so I feel like this is one thing that uh, that is actually uh, what we need to do and what we need to work on. And the second thing uh, for students, uh, I see that it's still the money. <laughs> so I feel like we need to work on the national level to work on the support mechanisms for the young adults that start their life alone. So it, it wouldn't be such a big step into like you're living with your parents, going to school, they drop you off to school, you come back and then suddenly you graduate and you need to move to another city, sometimes another country. You need to start figuring out what you eat, how to cook, how to where to live, uh, how to pay your pills, uh, how to pay taxes, how to work, how the work contracts work. So I feel like actually the support mechanisms, uh, both financial but also just access to um, a therapist, a um, career, um, advisor, etc., would be really beneficial in that That's sense. That's when some of you will call you snowflakes, because, you know, generations before you have gone through that. No, but, uh, but sorry, I'm, I, it, not my words, but yeah. others were. But, 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 but Katarina, the, um, there's some experience in, at least in, I know in Denmark and Sweden, that, uh, that, that, that sort of points to the importance of sort of specific processes, really sort of uh, conscious ways of sort of receiving and onboarding new students. So they've left their, uh, they've left their home, uh, they've left their, you know, their parents for the first time. They are now finding themselves, when they start a new education, in essentially a new, total new social setting with all the uncertainty that comes from being, you know, outside your normal, um, your sort of your normal safe environment. Would this be something that, as an education institution, that you could set up? Companies are really good at doing lengthy onboarding onboarding processes for new employees. Yet, when you start a, a new life as a student, then often you're expected to 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 sort of get your way around it yourself and perform early on. Yeah, I think this is uh, also a valid point because uh, what we see a lot is that. You just go there. Sometimes you don't even get uh, information. I'm actually starting a new uh, level, so I'm starting my master's. Uh, this, uh, I think the first day should be a 2nd of September. Uh, it's already August, and I have no information about anything. So I feel like uh, this is also something we are trying to work as students also on to actually create the information sheets, especially uh, this is where the mobility and internationalization of the world comes in. Uh, when you come from another country, you need to move to another country. You need the information. You need the information beforehand. You need to know it, actually. And I feel like this is also a, a valid thing which we need to work yeah, on. Yeah, there's actually documentation that it, 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 it significantly decreases dropout within the first three months if, if, 
if you find yourself in an organized, somehow structured, welcoming, welcoming en environment. Dina, what's your thoughts on, on, you know, if we look into the toolbox, you look into the toolbox every day when you work. If we look into the toolbox and, 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 and you know, which tool should we grab um, in order to, to, to essentially prevent, uh, sort of either prevent young people from, from falling into this situation or, 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 or very early on sort of um, uh, essentially grab them before they fall? I think uh, it's definitely crucial to work on the new legislations on the governmental level, but before we do, uh, it's a long process, but raising awareness would be very first step to begin with, uh, go back to families, actually. So raising what awareness. We do, what should we do with the families? What's talk the to parents. Uh, as Katerina said, I would be very <laughs> happy if my parents went to therapy. And not just... Um, not just, I don't mean refer them uh, to the therapist, but... Um, this was online, actually by the way, be this is being taped, I know, I know, but said, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone is <laughs> definitely welcome. But just to raise these issues, to, to talk openly, and uh, because it's important um, that we... I'm a parent myself, so uh, as a parent, I'm trying to model, actually, healthy social relationships, and uh, it's important to talk to your kids about healthy social relationships, not just uh, assume they're going to happen naturally. Sometimes they will, very good, mm -hmm. but not, so every, not every time. Some kids actually need uh, good talk about it. Mm. So raising awareness for me is the kind of level where everyone can contribute. And it, and, and it, and it will create an intergenerational bond then, uh, as I understand it also. Yeah. There's a question from the, from the uh, rear end. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for a very interesting conversation. Uh, my name is Ari Solstad, I'm from Norway, from an organization called Reform Resource Center for Men. Actually going to sit on the stage later on. Uh, loneliness comes from different things, but w what we do know is that loneliness often is connected with marginaliz marginalization and belonging to a group that isn't a part of the, the majority. So, in Estonia, what's your uh, experiences on, uh, let's say, the LGBT group? Am I to be a, a trans person, or be a homo, uh, homo person, or be a queer person? Uh, we know in Norway, and I guess also here, often lead to marginalization and uh, loneliness and also suicide. How is your um, uh, experiences with this? It's a clear question, thank you. Art actually or Dina, do you want to... clinical research has shown that there is a higher risk, actually, even in mm, higher suicide risk, whether someone belongs to one minority or another, it doesn't really matter, is it uh, LGBT, uh, other nationality, religious, based. But uh, in, in Estonia, definitely, I um, think we have actually <laughs> issues, uh, whether it's racial, sexual orientation, there could be still a lot of stigma. Katarina? Yeah, maybe from a student's perspective as well, uh, there's a lot of, uh, yes, we have marriage equality now in Estonia as a first Baltic state, um, but, but there's still a lot of uh, societal and political uh, processes going on which actually make you feel even more alone when you're uh, belonging, for example, to the LGBTQ plus uh, society. And what we have seen is, yes, there's a lot of risks, but I, I would like to come back again to the point I made last, uh, some time ago already, that uh, this is where the digitalization comes into play. Um, it's really nice when you have someone uh, you can actually talk to about it who actually feels that way. Uh, when it's really difficult for you to find a a person or a friend uh, s uh, in a similar situation in your physical space. So I feel like this is a good uh, solution. It, it doesn't solve everything, of course, but I feel like it is one good benefit of the digitalization that I see. Odd, I know you've also talked about um, sort of, um, as, I, as I remember it, talked about sort of mentor-mentee relation. I mean, you know, what are ways, for young people who've left their home, they may not have that connection with their parents, their parents may not have gone to therapy, i.e. there's not a conversation happening, 
they stand without a social support structure, they move into a new town, you know, this is this, this, this is essentially what happens to most young people. Where would those adults be? Uh, would they be at the educa education institution? Would they be at the, the workplace? Or um, where can you lean in and, and rely on support? I, I think still, like, for, for uh, young people, uh, essentially, still uh, eventually, for all of us, uh, our first connection is still with people that we can relate to. So for young people, other young people who have similar either interests or other sort of connecting attributes we're still looking for that group that we're belonging to especially like especially uh, when we're younger we're still like developing our own identity and as you in those transition phases we go either from high school to university we actually in, in a very direct sense we're leaving behind our identity because what we think of ourselves as isn't or what our identity is isn't so much what we think of our ourselves but what we think others think of us. So that's sort of one of the primary things that forms this idea of us or our own identity. Now when we move somewhere else, we have all new social connections. We have the opportunity to reinvent everything, but we also have this responsibility to do it. We have this pressure to do it. And it's very hard if you don't have those social skills or if just something doesn't work out so building those peer connections is still like the main thing, the main connection. And then from there on, if you're having issues, having this structure where you trust to seek support. Have we lost social skills? Have we ever had them? <laughs> Good question. We had, uh, I'm, way I'm only wonder wondering whether we're also seeing a generation so digitalized that some of the basic analog social skills, whether they've been impacted? I s like I would say rather not I mean probably okay. there's there's definitely effects but mm. I mean look at our adults look at our politicians there weren't social skills there in the first place there you go there you go any you any you I, I also want to hear the solutions from you but you also just reacted when I said yeah this. because um, I'm really keen of digitalization and, uh, and I've been working with it for 20 years and I I reckon that I, I think that digitalization has uh, um has that really really big minus that we don't meet people anymore when we go uh through transitions when you are young and go from your parents to stu to be uh, a, a young adult in society normally for years back when i was young you will have to talk to a lot of people i will talk with uh, the, the 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 university p uh, personnel i would talk to the municipality personnel i would talk to a lot of people during our, my way on on transmission today you can go from your parents and to university and don't speak to anybody and that's not the peers it's the system and i think the, the, the digitalization has um, had made it necessary that we redefine our society so we make new uh, structures for meeting each other and and um, and helping each other we need new structures because it's really really hard to go from your parents and it always has been to go for your parents and to be a young adult mm -hmm. but normally you had different people you could talk mm, to mm. in your traveling on that transmission. But you don't have that today. You have to find out everything yourself. And that's a really, really lonely place to be. So you're very much along the lines of both Katerina and Art on, on, that, on that. Are there any other solutions? We will take a question before we round off. Are there any other solutions that you would, from all your research and all the conversations you have with young people, uh, are, they, are, they, are, they, are they asking for something? Are they asking for us as adults, as parents, as decision makers to 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 help them along this 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 troubling journey of of becoming an adult. No, I, d I don't hear they're asking for help, and that's probably the problem, <laughs> mm. uh, because I think it's really structural. I think we have mm. to kick. You, we have to look at the structure, and I think I think really the problem is if you leave. Uh, the questions uh, to the young ones themselves, because I think it's a really, really hard place to stand mm. if you have to to uh, bear all those questions yourself. So I really think that we have to talk among generations and we have to work with the structure in the system because the digitalization 
has uh, brought a lack of people. That's good because we can. It's easier to do things, but the 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 back of that is that we don't talk that much to each other anymore. Thank you. There is a question here at the front as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, in there, sorry, sorry, again. So, um, the question is, um, like Dina mentioned, uh, they should talk to the parents to get the kids to have better skills. Uh, but I think that the easiest intervention point would be in schools. Because what we're talking about is a lack of, I think, a lack of social skills or la lack of certain skills that people have needs and they don't know how to meet their social needs so they feel lonely. But if they had those skills maybe from school uh, that could help them in the school environment also in their future lives. Thanks. Thanks for that. And let's pass on the microphone here. If, uh, y yeah. You know, you might be thinking about your response as we take a few more questions and then you can combine your, 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 your answers. Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, so loneliness can sometimes be a bit of a self-provoked effect where uh, people are a little bit in their hole and they, you're sad, you're not doing well, you don't want to get out of it. Um, how can we, at an institutional or cultural level, reach those that are in said hole? Because we often talk about sort of passive solutions that require the person in that hole to reach out to therapy, friends, find a community. How can we reach those that, at the moment, are not looking for help? Two really good questions, and there might be a third question here. But let's try and let's let's try some quick quick replies on first the importance of schools and the you know how can you uh, how, how can you um, how can we sort of um, do some of the um, do some of the important work there, and then secondly, which I think is a really relevant point, how do we identify and spot and reach out to those that don't come forward? So quickly, just giving two uh, sort of replies here. One, on the side of schools, yes, education is important. But education, schools, cannot produce significantly better people than the rest of society already expecting them. The schools are part of society. So if we try to fix every, everything to a school and don't work on the rest of society, don't work on families, don't work on our uh, workplaces, don't work on our public spaces or uh, narrative spaces, then we're just uh, trying to fix what we keep on breaking all everywhere else. So that schools have an important role, but uh, all of us uh, 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 outside of schools also need to get our things together. Uh, Thanks, John. Anyone else who wants to try and, yeah, uh, Katarina? Yeah, well, I recently went through school. Um, I, I agree with the sentiment, but I feel like the biggest effect, especially in the young age, comes actually from home. And uh, it ha happens usually, the trauma happens usually before uh, they reach the school age. So I feel like uh, schools are a nice uh, way to also, yes, affect it. But I, I would rather uh, direct the schools uh, to the second question, where we actually can, um, like we have mandatory school uh, for all the young people. Um, now we're trying to raise the age, etc. So I feel like this is actually the place where we could notice, start noticing the people um, and try to actually uh, be active in uh, trying to get them out. Uh, the same with the universities, but many of uh, the people don't actually reach universities. So I feel like schools could be one part of the solution for the people that actually are passive. But is there, I mean, putting yourself on the spot, I mean, because as young people, you can actually do a lot vis-a-vis -vis other young people who might be, you know, going through a hard period of their life or something like that. What can you as fellow students do for, you know, for, for other young students who might be sort of silently lonely, if you, if, if you like? Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of, uh, with the actually noticing uh, part, uh, we have already in uh, some universities, we have uh, uh, some courses, uh, voluntary courses about how to notice actually what is going around uh, you, because usually, especially when you're uh, 18 tw uh, until 24, the same age group we're talking about, then you're trying to invent yourself, your self-image, and you're really self-focused, I feel like. You're uh, all the time thinking about what others think about you, and then you sometimes forget. I feel that also on, on myself. I sometimes forget to look around and notice other people. So actually, uh, to learn the practices of noticing other people, how to actually see when someone is, I don't know, more quieter than usual, and then reach out to them. And I feel like 
sometimes again the digitalization comes into play here as well because it's really difficult sometimes uh, to speak face to face about your problems and but it's easier for example to text i mean this is also the the kind of uh, stigma we have that young people nowadays don't like to call and they're scared to call when they go to work uh, and then the other generations are shocked but uh, sometimes in these issues i feel like actually reaching out uh, through social media, texting, it's sometimes easier to actually uh, reach. But just as, we, um, yeah, just as we spoke about the importance of what, you know, what school institutions can do in order to promote inclusiveness, clearly as, as agents in that social sphere, we also have the obligation to be mindful uh, of, of, of our fellow humans, fellow students in this case, that might not be um, that might feel that they sort of stand outside the um, the uh, the collective, the social. Any, you had a quick. It, it has to be a quick uh, yeah, comment. Uh, just a quick answer to you. You ask uh, how can wh what can we do uh, in 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 Denmark? We have uh, reached out to uh, young uh, boys who has been isolated at home. They they are not uh, joining school any longer. They're just sitting home behind the screen, uh, and uh, I think. Uh, one of the way of, d they are not asking for help, but we have created groups for them, gaming groups. So we ask them to come to us and only game with us. So when they meet us and game with us, uh, we start talking about how to socialize, how to make sure you sleep or eat or whatever, and we start building a new society for them. And a lot of those boys have, haven't been outside the room for a year, and now we start building uh, a society around them so i think i think the i think of course the peers have to help each other but i also think the the older generation the teachers the municipalities has to create new uh, um, opportunities to create new kind of uh, communities for 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 people not only young people but for people because we have to redefine community because of digitalization has changed the way we meet each other so we have to be more creative. I have to cut you off now Dina, yeah. we have to have another question. This is what we can do in Denmark by the way. There is a last question from there. Do we have a microphone that we can pass on to the lady there? Lovely. I hope the question can also be brief. Thank you. My name is Sirla Zalmisto. It's not a question, it's more like a comment or reflection. Go ahead. I'm a landscape architect and urban planner and I take on one of the comments uh, before that look how awful is our built environment. So we don't need to agree with that. So why don't we change it so mm. we would have more more quality built environment and physical spaces to meet and get together, well, to, to spend time together so significant connections can happen. So it's not only responsibility for planners or landscape architects, it's, it's, it's all responsibility. So why don't we just be more demanding, so I'm encouraging you to be more active on how our built environment is built. So, so this can be one. Mm. A, simi a similar bit recommendation was yeah. made in, in in Latvia. So thank for that also. Yeah, thank you. I'm just going to try and summarize this a little bit before we come to the final part, which I where I know you've all prepared a question. So we did a piece of research with a big foundation uh, in in Denmark two years ago when we asked a a, uh, a representative sample of young people of what what would they find what solutions would they be looking for and they pointed to four general things we've commented on all of them a we need to challenge the ideals around the good young life what is it what is the perfect life as a as a young people we need to challenge that through education through in conversations with our parents with politicians we need to be able to create alternative ideals, nuanced ideals around what a good life is. Secondly, relieve the pressure on young people. It's too demanding. There's too much acceleration. Thirdly, we need to be better at creating, meeting spaces and building more inclusive social community. So that's the structural part of it, the design part of it. There's also the, the peer obligation part of it. We all have to be mindful of inviting everyone in. Um, and, and then lastly, we need to be better at allowing for safe conversations. Conversation about what is hard, what is difficult, and we don't have that at the moment. We've touched upon that in terms of our parents, in terms of cross generations. So just to say that in terms of what at least young people 
themselves have been asking for in a big in 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 a big survey. I think we've covered a lot of it. Now, rushing to the end because I know the clock is also ticking. See, just as we initiated this debate with a question from Latvia, we have to send on a question to the Democracy Festival next week in Norway. It's they will be debating gender identity and loneliness. And see, I've asked all the panelists to prepare a question that they would like to ask the panel in Norway to discuss. However, we cannot send forward four questions. We can only send forward one question. So I'm going to ask the audience to vote which of the four questions is the most relevant to pass forward. Is the task understood? Yes, you're nodding. Brilliant. You'll get four questions. They have to be brief. And we'll get the audience to vote. So remember the four questions. We'll start with Dina's question. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it was a tricky question for me, as I always want to get away from gender identity and see the human behind every person. Um, but my question would be, how lonely is a woman in a modern masculine world? How lonely is a woman in a masculine world? Oh, that's very crisp. <laughs> Kazarina, can you beat that one? <laughs> I feel like I can't, but um, <laughs> since I come from an educational background, my question would be how can educational institutions, be that universities or primary schools, uh, kindergartens, uh, if you wish, uh, how can educational institutions actually help to uh, reduce the uh, exactly the gender differences we have uh, in the mental health sector? So Odd. my question uh, builds off of the idea that uh, or uh, normalized genders are, or, or, nor or what we consider normal in genders is what we've as society standardized, not what is actually natural and uh, that we have a variety of people. So the question really is, how do we break out of restrictive gender st uh, standards? And stereotypes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Annie? Okay. Uh, surprisingly, uh, my question is about digitalization. <laughs> Uh, so my question is, how can digital platforms and social media be used positively to build communities for those with gender identi identity challenges while also preventing further isolation? Wow. I, I, I'm not sure I can remember <laughs> the exact <laughs> phrasing of, of all four of them. But now I want to see a show of hands. Dina's question. Who would like to vote for Dina's question to go to the Norway Democracy Festival? Show of hands. <laughs> not, not that many, Dina. <laughs> Katarina's question on what education institutions can do. Who would like us to put that question forward? Maybe one hand more. Art's question, which I really can't rephrase, but it was around, uh, it was around uh, uh, challenging gender standards and gender stereotypes. Wow. Annie, I think they know the answer to your question. <laughs> Who wants to stick with Annie's question around digitalization? There's one, two, three. <laughs> Still, I do think we have a winner, and the winner is, is, is soon is heading into a new job next week. Art, your question will be forwarded <laughs> to Norway. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A victory is very nice for my male ego. <laughs> 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 well, thank you for today. Remember that all the insights from this debate and from the, uh, from the previous as well as the subsequent debates um, will help inspire the Nordic Council of Ministers' work on the new action plan in the social area in connection with their vision 2030. Thanks for prioritizing to be here. Thanks for asking questions. Thanks to our really competent panel, Dina, Katarina, Art, and Annie. And thanks to the Nordic Council of Ministers for making this debate possible here in this tent. Have a fantastic Opinion Festival.